One of the most famous exoplanets ever discovered is 55 Cancri E, officially named Janssen. It's definitely in the top 10 most talked about exoplanets in the media today, because many people think it could be made of diamonds. But Janssen is just one world of the much larger 55 Cancri system. The other four 55 Cancri planets don't get nearly as much attention, even though they're all just as interesting. So, I'm here to fix that. This is episode 3 of my Grand Tour series, where I explore specific exoplanet systems in more depth. Be sure to watch episode 1, A Grand Tour of Alpha Centauri, and episode 2, A Grand Tour of Trappist 1, when you're done watching this. 55 Cancri is one of my personal favorite exoplanet systems simply because of how interesting all of its planets are. There are 5 total known planets in 55 Cancri as of the time of making this video in June of 2024, but more might be discovered later. The system itself has two stars, but all of the known planets so far orbit around the bigger of the two, Copernicus. Copernicus, which is also called 55 Cancri A, is a K-type star about 90% of the mass and radius of the Sun. Copernicus possesses an unusually high amount of carbon, which makes estimating its age difficult. We know it's probably around 8 billion years old. Copernicus has much more carbon than oxygen, which could have huge implications for its planets. The planets around a star form out of the same material as the star itself, so if Copernicus has a lot of carbon, then all of its planets could be similarly carbon-rich. That brings us to the first planet of the 55 Cancri system, Janssen. Janssen, also called 55 Cancri E before being given an official name in 2015, is a rocky planet on orbit that takes less than 18 hours to complete. It's just under 8 times the mass of Earth, making it half the size of Neptune. Despite similar mass planets being mini-Neptunes, like the potentially water-rich Enipotia that I talk about in other videos, Janssen is almost certainly a rocky planet like Earth. Blasted by intense sunlight with temperatures that put Venus to shame, Janssen is covered in a global lava ocean. Being so close to its star, it's tidally locked, so nightside lava is cooler than the rest of the planet, but exactly how much cooler depends on if it has an atmosphere or not. Despite Janssen being rigorously studied by dozens of telescopes, including the James Webb Space Telescope, we really don't know what its atmosphere is like. When I was originally writing the script in March, the consensus was that Janssen's atmosphere is most likely airless or has an extremely thin atmosphere made of vaporized metals. However, a few weeks later, the airless or thin atmosphere scenario for Janssen has been ruled out. It's much more likely that the planet has a substantial atmosphere made of carbon dioxide and monoxide. This goes to show just how quickly things in astronomy change, as I've already made videos saying Janssen was most likely airless, and that's now outdated. It's yet another example of why you should always check the sources of older videos and see if they've been reviewed or are still accurate. Things constantly change in exoplanet science, and you need to check if videos made more than a year or so ago are still accurate to prevent misinformation. Another example of this misinformation would be J1407b, which everyone thought was a planet with big rings but doesn't actually exist. Anyways, there's also some evidence of large-scale volcanic activity across Janssen. But the most famous part about Janssen, of course, is that people say it could be made of diamond. But this is unconfirmed. Janssen could be rich in carbon because it formed out of the same material as its star. If it is, then it could be made of more carbon than oxygen, making it a carbon planet. Due to the heat and pressures of the interior of the planet, this carbon could be compressed into large quantities of diamond, potentially making up to one-third of the planet's total mass. Density measurements of the planet even seem to support this, but we don't know for sure. Even if Janssen is one-third diamond, it wouldn't immediately make diamonds worthless like people think. Yes, Janssen would be worth a few no million dollars, but the vast majority of the diamonds would probably be deep underground, I meaning you have to tunnel through miles of molten lava just to get to them. Plus, being eight times the mass of Earth, the cost to launch a rocket off this planet would be enormous. Diamond mining on Janssen probably wouldn't be all that profitable, and I talk specifically about that in my video about mining diamonds on Janssen. Anyways, the second planet out from Copernicus is Galileo. Taking about 15 days to orbit the star, it's nowhere near as hot as Janssen. Galileo is a hot Jupiter planet that's about 85% the mass of Jupiter, with an unknown radius. Galileo's exact temperature is unknown, but it's probably at least a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Because of its temperature, we can guess at the atmospheric conditions of the planet, assuming its composition is similar to Jupiter. Galileo is most likely blue in color, with an upper atmosphere devoid of clouds entirely. The planet is also slowly evaporating, losing its atmosphere space at a rate slower than most hot Jupiters, but still fast enough to be noticeable. It's unknown if the planet hosts any large moons, but given the close distance to its star, it's unlikely. Of course, we recently discovered an exomoon candidate around the hot Jupiter Wasp-49b, which I talk about in another video, so the chance for Galileo to host large moons isn't entirely off the table yet. Other than that, not much is known about Galileo. That will be a common theme for the rest of the video, since Janssen is, by far, the most studied planet of the system. But Galileo is also about 15 million miles away from Janssen, meaning on Janssen's night side, you can see Galileo like a small moon in the sky. 
The next planet of the system is Brya, a gaseous ice giant taking about 44 days to orbit Copernicus, almost double the distance of Galileo. Only the minimum mass of Brya is known, so it must be at least 17% the mass of Jupiter, or about 51 times the size of Earth. It's most likely around the mass of Saturn. It has a mildly eccentric orbit, meaning temperatures on the planet likely vary by a lot. Like Galileo, Brya is probably blue in color, with temperatures in the hundreds of degrees. From what I can tell so far, Brya is just a smaller, colder version of Galileo, with a similar environment, just with a lower gravity and smaller size. But this may change as we get to know these places better. Because of its elliptical orbit, Brya could also have strong weather patterns caused by shifts in temperature, but we don't know for certain yet. The fourth planet from the star, Harriet, is pretty similar to Brya in mass. However, it's almost four times as far away from Copernicus as Brya, putting it right in the middle of Copernicus's habitable zone, on a year that takes about 260 days to complete. Harriet itself probably isn't habitable. It has an orbital eccentricity even worse than Brya's, and it gets 20 million kilometers closer to its star during its closest approach than its furthest distance. Temperatures on this planet are unknown, but they probably vary between 80 degrees Fahrenheit and negative 100, or about negative 73 to 26 degrees Celsius. But unlike Janssen and Galileo and Brya, Harry is far enough away from its star to not be tidally locked, at a similar distance Venus is from the Sun. It's also far enough away that it could potentially host large moons. However, I wouldn't get my hopes up about habitable moons around Harriet. It has a minimum estimated mass between Neptune and Saturn, so if the moon systems of Neptune and Saturn are anything to go by, Harriet's moons will most likely be airless balls of rock similar to our moon. Even if Harriet manages to host a large moon like Titan, it's unlikely to host an atmosphere, because of its distance to its star. Titan, and other moons with atmospheres like Triton, only manage to hold onto their atmospheres because of how cold they are. If Titan was put at Earth's distance from the Sun, it would lose its atmosphere because of the increased radiation. When people talk about gas giants in the habitable zones around stars, habitable moons are usually brought up. But keep in mind that we already have an example of a large moon in the habitable zone, Earth's moon. It's the fifth biggest moon in the solar system, and clearly doesn't have oceans or an atmosphere. From what we can tell, a moon much larger than our own, especially one with an atmosphere, is pretty unlikely around Harriet. But that doesn't make the planet uninteresting. Planets don't need to be habitable to be interesting. Harriet, like Brya, probably has drastic temperature variations, which would likely make for some very unique weather on the planet not seen in the solar system. Harriet is my personal favorite planet of the 55 Cancri system, simply because it has the potential to be a really unique place. I talk about this more in my video about temperate ice giants and Haitian planets. After Harriet, there aren't any planets for the next few astronomical units. Between Mars and Jupiter in the solar system, we have the asteroid belt, but between Harriet and the last planet, Lipperhe, no asteroid belt has been found. This has led people to suspect that additional unseen and even potentially rocky planets could exist within this gap. It's about the size of the distance between Venus and Jupiter in our solar system, so additional planets could very well exist. Simulations show that plants similar in size to Brya and Harriet will be stable in this area, and rocky plants like Earth will be stable at 1 to 2 AU from the star, including areas on the outer edge of Copernicus's habitable zone. So far, no planets here have been confirmed to exist, and we don't even have any candidates. This is all just speculation. The planets are not prohibited in this region, so there is a chance they could exist. However, beyond this empty region, we come to the largest and furthest world from Copernicus, Lipperhe. Lipperhe is a giant planet with a minimum mass over three times larger than Jupiter, with data suggesting that number is closer to five times larger. This makes it bigger than every 55 Cancri planet so far combined. In fact, you could combine every known planet in 55 Cancri and every planet in the solar system together, and it still wouldn't be as big as Lipperhe. Lipperhe takes about 14 years to orbit Copernicus at a distance extremely similar to Jupiter in our solar system. This, by definition, makes Lipperhe a Jupiter analog, but with its high mass it likely doesn't resemble Jupiter at all. Because of this huge mass, Lipperhe generates a lot of internal heat. Like every planet except Janssen, the exact temperatures are unknown, but it probably is significantly hotter than Jupiter because of this internal heat. These temperatures could cause huge layers of clouds made of water to form on Lipperhe, giving the planet a white color, unlike the ammonia clouds of Jupiter. Lipperhe's radius is unknown, but surprisingly, it's probably smaller than Jupiter's. This is because of the planet's high gravity, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 times higher than Earth's. It pulls the atmosphere down, lowering the radius. The high carbon concentrations of Copernicus also probably lower the radius even further, since carbon is dense and Lipperhe probably has a lot of it. In fact, assuming it does have a lot of carbon, there's nothing preventing Lipperhe from having large quantities of diamonds as well. It could potentially have far more than Janssen thanks to the high pressures. This is true of every planet in the system, and I again talk about this more in my video about mining diamonds on Janssen. 
but as far as I can tell, there's no actual research into this. This is just a guess on my part, so take it with a grain of salt. So far, no other planets are known to orbit Copernicus past Liberhe, but given the similarities to our own solar system, it's completely possible for there to be some undiscovered Saturn or Neptune analogs in the outer reaches of the system. Of course, the amount of trans and planets will probably be limited due to the gravitational pull of the second star of the system, 55 Cancri b. 55 Cancri b, the star, is not to be confused with 55 Cancri b, the planet, which is Galileo. Both have the exact same name, except the star has a capital B and the planet has a lowercase b. This is one of the reasons that I use the proper names of planets rather than the designations to avoid situations like this. But for planets that don't have proper names, like HD 189733b, which has a second star in the system also called HD 189733b, just remember that exoplanets will always use lowercase letters at the end, and stars will always use uppercase. So, the planet HD 189733b is the lowercase b, while the star has an uppercase b. Anyways, 55 Cancri b is a small red dwarf on a wide orbit around Copernicus. It doesn't have any known planets, but from what I can tell, nobody's actually searched for any yet. There is some evidence that 55 Cancri b could actually be two stars, but from what we can tell now, it's only one. The 55 Cancri system is, by far, one of the most interesting exoplanet systems we've come across so far. From the never-ending lava oceans of Janssen, to the temperate skies of Harriet, and potentially several new worlds still waiting to be discovered, 55 Cancri absolutely needs to be studied more. Hopefully we'll know more about the worlds of the system in the near future. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out the rest of my Grand Tour series, and comment below what other systems should be included.